We've lived in an unprecedented era in medical care, the era of antibiotics. It's possible that this will be a very short-lived era. Ever since Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin, antibiotic-resistant strains started to be found in U.S. hospitals. Antibiotic resistance was thought to be a development of the modern age. This has been proven not to be the case. Just as antibiotics have been around long before man discovered them, so has antibiotic resistance. Researcher DaCosta and his associates examined core samples taken from the Alaskan permafrost and looked for evidence of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. They used PCR to identify homologs that included the ribosomal protection protein, TET-M. These determinants were found in samples that also contained DNA from megafauna that's been dated to the early Pleistocene, placing these samples approximately 30,000 years ago. The dawn of antibiotics also brought with it a new period of selective pressures on pathogenic microbes. Since the source of antibiotic resistance appears to have come from soil bacteria, why would this affect us? Bacteria have an interesting way of sharing genetic information via horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal transfer allows the antibiotic genes found in soil bacteria to make their way into pathogenic organisms. The rise of antibiotic resistance has led to concerns that soon all pathogenic microbes will soon be superbugs. Superbugs are those that are no longer sensitive to most or all antibiotics. The most infamous of superbugs are the microbes belonging to species of Staphylococci and Streptococci and are not the most worrisome. It's been theorized that the rise of antibiotic use has resulted in the slackening of aseptic techniques used by both hospital personnel and laypersons. As we have become more aware of the dangers of depending on antibiotics, a resurgence of strong aseptic techniques have returned to hospitals and homes. Increased vigilance is thought to be the major reason that we have seen a decline in MRSA infection since 2005. Typhoid fever, a water and foodborne disease caused by Salmonella typhi, is regularly associated with poor sanitation. Individuals infected often develop a rash, and those who survive the disease may become carriers and pass the bacteria on via the oral fecal route, a route of transmission of a disease wherein pathogens and fecal particles pass from one host and are introduced into the oral cavity of another. Typhoid fever causes over 20 million cases per year. This infection is particularly troublesome in developing countries, and drug resistance is becoming an issue in the management of this particular infection. Multi-drug resistant strains have evolved quickly in response to the pressure of antimicrobials. Archaeologists and bioarchaeologists regularly link outbreaks of typhoid to cramped and unsanitary conditions, such as mining camps, including one site excavated in South Africa. While the etiologies, or causes, behind the lesions observed in a mass grave at the Coffee Fontaine mine in South Africa is unknown, Laube and colleagues suggest that the poor working conditions at the diamond mine may have led to a typhoid epidemic among the workers in 1896. Out of the 36 individuals they analyzed, among them 33 males, two females, and one indeterminate, the researchers observed a number of pathologies indicative of work and systemic metabolic stress in the skeletons. For example, they noted vertebral problems such as intervertebral osteochondrosis, scmoral nodes, and vertebral osteophytosis, all of which suggest strenuous physical labor. According to them, the latter fits well with the heavy physical labor expected of miners at that time. Moreover, the link evidence of linear enamel hypoplasia to poor nutritional conditions in the, at the mine, they conclude that the combination of terrible working and living conditions and poor nutritional intake would have increased the susceptibility of these individuals to a wide variety of infectious diseases such as typhoid fever, cholera, and tuberculosis. At the same time, ancient microbial DNA, also known as ADNA, was extracted from the dental pulp of the skeletal remains of three individuals found in an ancient cemetery in Athens from the time of the Plague of Athens outbreak. DNA sequences of Salmonella typhi were identified, suggesting that typhoid fever may have been the cause of the Plague of Athens. Many different pathogens have been suggested as the cause, but there has been much disagreement due to the lack of paleopathological and microbiological evidence. The molecular diagnosis of typhoid fever is consistent with the symptoms recorded by the historian Thucydides, including fever, rash, and diarrhea. Other features described by Thucydides, however, are inconsistent with the present-day form of typhoid fever, such as the nature of onset. This inconsistency may be due to the evolution of typhoid fever over time, possibly due in part to the evolution of antibiotic resistance, 
resulting in a different manifestation today. These inconsistencies, however, have led to disagreement about the conclusion that typhoid fever was the causative agent of the plague of Athens, and more research remains to be done. The method of ADNA extraction and analysis has been increasingly used in archaeology, and some researchers have used this method to attempt to identify the pathogens responsible for various historical epidemics, such as the Black Death. It is important to stay conscious of the fact that typhoid fever is not visible in the skeletal record, as the disease affects only the soft tissue. Because of this, documentary sources, including art and written records, are especially invaluable for archaeologists and bioarchaeologists studying certain types of health and diseases and the recent and ancient past. Thus, even though skeletal remains aid enormously in the interpretation of the history of disease load in a population, bioarchaeologists recognize that the greater number of and variety of perspectives on the pathological past with which they can engage, the greater the chance that their analysis will not be completely disabled. In 1907, a sanitary engineer for New York's Department of Health named George A. Soper was called to the rented Oyster Bay vacation home of New York banker General William Henry Warren, who was spending the summer there with his family. The household had experienced an outbreak of typhoid fever in late August of that year, in which 6 out of 11 people residing in the house had mysteriously fallen ill. The house showed no signs of contamination even after careful investigation, from the well to the privy and even to the neighboring property. After turning his attention to the servants, he found that the cook, a middle-aged Irish immigrant named Mary Mallon, had begun working for the Warrens three weeks before the first family member had become ill, the exact incubation period for typhoid. Further investigation in the New York Domestic Service Agency uncovered a suspicious history. Mallon never remained in the same position for long, and several of the households she had worked for previously had succumbed to typhoid fever before the Warrens. When Soper confronted Mallon, she refused to believe him and chased him from the property. It took an ambulance full of health professionals three hours to chase and subdue her, upon which she was taken to the Willard Parker Hospital for examination. Analysis of her stool and urine confirmed the presence of the typhoid bacterium Salmonella typhi and identified her as the first healthy carrier of the disease in North America. At this time, the theory of a healthy carrier had only been postulated by German bacteriologist Robert Koch. The theory had not even been proven. Before the world came to fully understand the cause and transmission of typhoid fever through the unwilling case study of Mary Mallon, it was generally believed that typhoid came from polluted water or milk, decaying organic matter, or even sewer gas. Personal hygiene at this time, the late 19th and early 20th century, was progressive, but the general public was mostly uninformed about germ theory and the spread of microbes. Mallon's infrequent practice of hand washing after using the bathroom, the cause of the spread of typhoid to her employers, was hardly out of the norm in the time period. Mallon was offered release if she agreed to have her gallbladder removed, which health professionals postulated with the site of the bacterium growth. However, no doctors instructed her on washing her hands thoroughly or informed her that that not preparing raw food for consumption would significantly reduce transmission of the disease. 
Unable to comprehend the situation and enraged by her treatment, Malin refused the operation and was subsequently quarantined to North Brother Island on the East River for three years. Furious with her situation and refusing to believe that she was a carrier for typhoid, she penned an angry letter in 1909 responding to the Department of Health's decision that reveals a public lack of understanding about general germ theory of the time. She was released in 1910 with strict orders not to return to her previous position as cook, but failed to follow them. She was quarantined again when a 1915 typhoid outbreak at a maternity hospital in New York, where she was working as a cook, alerted officials to her disobedience. She remained on North Brother Island until her death in 1938. Over the course of her lifetime, she infected an estimated 47 to 51 people, three of whom died from the disease. Yet, even while she was quarantined, New York health officials identified 400 other healthy carriers of the disease, none of whom were forcibly quarantined like she was. In the social context of the period, the demonization of a female healthy typhoid carrier, while hundreds of others were simply educated and allowed to keep their careers, was a very interesting commentary. Bringing in questions about Malin's gender, ethnicity, or status as an Irish immigrant and the singularity of her treatment. MRSA is a form of Staphylococcus aureus that has developed a resistance to the antibiotics used to treat skin infections similar to it. Staphylococcus aureus was first discovered in 1880 in pus and the surgical abscess of a knee joint. When staph was first discovered, it was not common to see what we know today as MRSA. Skin infections from Staphylococcus were treated with the antibiotic methicillin, which was first introduced in 1959. However, as treatment of staph with antibiotics became the common practice, natural selection caused methicillin-resistant strains of Staphylococcus to emerge. These strains became the superbug MRSA, and first received attention in 1990 when massive outbreaks began occurring in hospitals. While between 2-10% to of the population are long-term carriers of the superbug, infection occurs at surgical sites, open wounds, and in the lungs. Colonized individuals, or carriers, have much greater chance of infection, but infection can also occur through transfer from skin-to-skin -skin contact, like on the hands of a healthcare worker. This is the reason infections are common in hospitals or long-term care facilities, because the victims often have suppressed immune systems and only a small lapse in hygiene is required to transfer the bacterium. MRSA infections usually begin with an injury and then develop into an infection. Symptoms include redness, warmth, and swelling that develops into tender skin or boils and blisters. Patients may experience chills, fever, or acute pain. In serious cases, the patient can experience lethargy and headaches. Once it's progressed, the infection looks pretty nasty. We had the chance to interview a former victim of MRSA. The interviewee has chosen to remain anonymous, and their voice and features have been modified. So I was in middle school when I first got MRSA. I got it from my brother, who um, had got it at the school showers, the locker rooms, because he was on the high school football team, and me and him shared a bathroom. So uh, he got it first, and I didn't realize that I'd actually been infected when he got it. He didn't know that it was MRSA or a staph infection, and the thing with MRSA is that there's a lot of pressure. So when he tried to relieve the pressure, he was actually pushing it farther into the bone and had to go to the hospital because he got a bone infection from it. So a thing with MRSA is at first, for the first like couple hours when you first notice it, you think that it's something like a pimple or maybe you hurt it or bruised it because it's this little red mark that has that's kind of painful. But then, as the hours go on, it gets hot, and it gets bigger, the pressure builds up, and it actually hurts to just kind of move your body around that area. And I got it on my legs a lot. So, it would hurt to bend my leg, it would hurt to sit down, because sometimes I would get it on the backs of my thighs. Um, once I got it near the bend of my knee, so it actually hurt just to walk and bend my leg. So, the pain actually gets pretty big, because the pressure is so big and you really want to relieve that pressure, but that only makes it worse, so you kind of have to leave it there and let the antibiotics do its job, which can take a, about a day or two for it to kick in, sometimes longer. The unfortunate thing is that it wasn't just me and my brother. My mom then got it also, so then we were trying really hard not to let my dad get it because he was the last one in the family who didn't have it. So things like separating out hygiene products. My dad started using a different shower a lot of the times, actually, especially if one of us had an outbreak at the time, because that's kind of the big thing, is that if you have an outbreak and some of that gets into an open wound or whatever, and it's 
really contagious, especially in the showers, because that's when you're washing. Um, so we had to alter how we showered. I now, it's kind of um, carried over into how I do things at school now. Like, I never will go into a shower without shower shoes. I never let anybody borrow any of my things. Partly because I don't want to get anything from them, but also because I don't want to infect anybody else. Among MRSA's detrimental physical symptoms, it has a noticeable effect on social behavior as well. I have to avoid things like donating blood, but I can't tell my friends why I'm not donating blood because that's uncomfortable and I don't really want people to know. Also, I remember, because I didn't want people to know, and they were on my legs if it was hot, and things like putting jeans on was painful. So you didn't want to go and put something on that would give pressure to your leg. So I would put on these, those really large band-aids because people would think I just cut myself and that would cover the whole thing. And while it was uncomfortable, it was less uncomfortable or I'd wear tights so that people actually never knew that I had MRSA the entire time I had it. Although it is widely considered a hospital acquired illness, it is spreading into the general population through communal pathways. A recent outbreak among the Tampa Bay Buccaneers sent three players to the hospital with serious infections due to their dirty locker rooms. Much like typhoid, MRSA can be avoided by simply maintaining proper hygiene by washing your hands frequently. However, once MRSA begins its destructive path, a widespread panic induces new cleaning regulations, quarantines, and a demand for more powerful weapons against the superbug. In the age when antibiotics were used as a magic silver bullet, cleaning regulations and quarantining were no longer prioritized and the superbug was allowed to grow. Much of the panic associated with MRSA comes from the undeniable end of the golden age of medicine. The implications of MRSA have even had an effect on politics in the UK. Public outrage at the rate of MRSA infection in UK hospitals was used as political fodder for the Conservative Party. The potential lethality, the inability to eradicate it, and the ease of transmission are some of the reasons why MRSA infects social realms as easily as it does the body. MRSA infections, as well as other infectious diseases, bring to light the human response to illness and fear. From a skeletal archaeological perspective, MRSA mostly affects soft tissue, such as skin. This means that evidence of MRSA will be incredibly difficult to detect in most cases because it doesn't leave enough drastic evidence behind that will last far into the future. However, there is one symptom of MRSA that does leave skeletal evidence behind. Osteomyelitis, a bone or joint infection, is one symptom of severe cases. In these cases, the infection penetrates into the bone and sometimes the bone marrow. Acute osteomyelitis, AO, is the most common form related to MRSA. AO can be diagnosed and seen within two weeks of infection and comes before the chronic form. It is characterized by sepsis during the infection and new bone growth after. In order to treat osteomyelitis in the modern day, antibiotics are usually the first step taken. This can clear up the infection and lead to new bone growth. However, other treatments are much easier to detect in the archaeological record. In pre-antibiotic times, trepanation was a common treatment method for osteomyelitis. This involved opening the bone to allow for pus to drain out of it. However, this method has fallen out of use in the treatment of MRSA. Much more common is surgical debridement, where the infected and oftentimes necrotic part of the bone, along with a small portion of healthy bone, is surgically removed. This treatment is very distinctive in the skeletal record. If evidence of surgical debridement, which is caused by a bone infection, is found along with evidence of a surgical operation that is contemporaneous with the debridement on the skeleton, then it would be reasonable to assume that the need for debridement was ultimately caused by a post-operative infection. If the skeleton can be dated to the age of antibiotics, then the most common cause would be an antibiotic-resistant strain, of which MRSA is the most common in hospitals. Even though the exact extent of MRSA's prevalence may not be visible from the skeletal record alone because of its manifestation in soft tissue, it can still be seen in some cases. At present, things are starting to look better for staphylococci, including MRSA, and streptococci, with increased infection control and more drug options. In order to avoid this catastrophe, we must reduce selective practices and resume public health practices that reduce infection rates. Use of broad-spectrum antibiotics should be eliminated in favor of the best narrow-spectrum solution.